Good afternoon, all. We're going to start our second session uh, with Dr. Hannah McGregor, who's already been introduced, but I would like to give just another little brief introduction because I've known Hannah since we were both graduate students. She's always been this cool, by the way. Um, I get cooler every year. It's true. Um, and, and I'm not just saying this as a friend and colleague, but Hannah's podcasts, particularly Secret Feminist Agenda, is one of the few occasions in my life where I learn something. <laughs> right. um, one of my, no, the, the podcast you had interviewing someone from the BDSM community and. Pervert Evangelism is yeah. what that episode's called. Um, which normally I would not have an occasion or an op opportunity to hear from uh, a person from a community that I'm not a part of at least all the time. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but there was a term that came up called aftercare, right? And this was a phrase that I'd never heard before. And speaking about feminism and care in our culture, aftercare is the notion that after you have an intimate experience with someone, before that occurs, you actually discuss how you're going to treat each other afterwards. And this blew my mind. Um, as a cis male who grew up in a patriarchal society, this term had never occurred to me before. And had I known about this term as a younger person, how my life would have been different and better because of that information, right? Um, so Hannah truly is someone, I think, who's having a profound effect on society through her conversations, through her communities, and her willingness to share. So please join me in welcoming Hannah here for her talk on podcasting and peer review. Thank you, Matt. That was very kind and also like a lot of pressure. Like, all right, everybody, you ready for me to have a profound effect on your lives? Ooh. Um, yeah, so here's what I'm going to do. I am going to walk you through just a little bit sort of my personal history around podcasting, how I came to podcasting, the podcast that I make. And then I'm going to move into Secret Feminist Agenda, which is my research project on peer reviewing podcasts. But it doesn't make much sense as a project without, um, at least as far as I'm concerned, without the sort of framing of how I arrived at, at making podcasts in the first place. So you're gonna notice a problem, which is that I accidentally numbered multiple slides one because I don't have a PhD in counting, so that's fine. So this used to be what podcasting, why podcasting, and how podcasting. Um, so the third part, how podcasting, is now just the next hour. We're gonna have a little workshop on getting started in podcasting. Um, so what podcasting, which is what podcasts do I make? Um, and later on, why do I make podcasts? So the first podcast that I started making was in 2015. It is called Witch Please. In 2015, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta, um, where I was, I was finishing up my postdoc. And um, I was right in that sweet spot of people gaining their PhDs in the humanities, where when I started my PhD, there were jobs. And by the time I finished my PhD, there were no jobs. And everybody was like, too bad, sucker. You're not that interesting. You're not getting a job. And I was like, Oh, dang, spent a long time getting this education. Um, so I was feeling a moment of disillusionment with the status quo of academia, particularly in the ways that I had been professionalized to be told I had to publish in particular ways, I had to behave in particular ways, otherwise I would be unhirable in this super competitive job market. And so one day, my friend Marcel and I were talking about how much we missed reading, and we were fantasizing about the idea of rereading the Harry Potter series together. And then Marcel, who had a little bit of experience in community radio, was like, well, why don't we make a podcast about Harry Potter? And I was like, yeah, OK, sure, why not? Um, we had between us uh, a single Zoom recorder, a little sort of handheld audio recorder, and one microphone that we just passed back and forth when it was our turns to talk. And that is how we recorded the entirety of Witch Please, just in various living rooms and at dining room tables, drinking wine, eating chips, and passing a single microphone back and forth as we talked to each other about how what made us cry in the most recent Harry Potter book. And what we were doing in a way that we hadn't quite theorized yet is that we were 
um, breaking a lot of the rules we'd been taught around what we could do as academics in terms of um, having conversations about texts, you know, the thing we'd been trained to do, but having those conversations in ways that put um, our emotions and our relationship with one another, our friendship and our bodies back into um, the actual uh, texture of what our scholarship could sound like. It didn't occur to us that what we were doing was scholarly until people started inviting us to speak at um, universities. We're like, come talk about the way that you're transforming scholarly communication. And we were like, are, are we? Okay. All right, cool. We thought we were just getting drunk and talking about Harry Potter, but I guess this is scholarship now. Um, so I'm going to play you just like a few seconds. This is the very first episode of Witch Plays um, recorded in Marcel's uh, tiny bachelor apartment in, at the time in Edmonton um, after we had consumed a full bottle of wine. Friends, witches, hey, wizards, yeah, that's good sound quality. Warlocks and hags, squibs, and everybody else. We're all equal. Uh, welcome to Witch Please, the inaugural podcast in which Marcel Cosman and Hannah McGregor, that's me, <laughs> talk about our feelings and thoughts about the Harry Potter series. So that was Witch Please. Um, and while it got a little bit tighter and a little bit better produced over time, it maintained that kind of looseness. And over the two years that I was making Witch Please with Marcel, I was also sort of starting on the job market. And Heidi, you're the best. Heidi brought me a coffee. Um, uh, starting on the job market, and lo and behold, I got a job in a publishing program where their primary interest in what I was doing was making scholarly podcasts. It was just this thing. It was just this, this dumb hobby I started. Um, they were really excited about the way that I was interested in experimenting with new media publishing and non-traditional approaches to scholarly communication, which is the thing I started calling it. And so once I started at SFU, I was like, okay, Let's make this serious. I'm going to do a serious podcast scholarship thing. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew that I was interested in working with a university press. I started having conversations with Siobhan McMenemy, who is the managing editor at Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Siobhan is a really incredible scholarly editor who is really engaged in the question of how we can expand the audience for scholarship. And she was interested in the idea of making a peer-reviewed podcast. So she came to me and she was like, why don't we do this project? And I was like, neat. And we went and we got a shirt grant to sort of prototype the idea of making a scholarly podcast and test run some approaches to peer review. And then in the meantime, I accidentally got bored one day and I started this podcast. Um, Secret Feminist Agenda was inspired by the fact that I already owned the URL because I'd made a joke about it one day and I bought the URL. Um, this is, see the spirit in which I start my projects? Um, so, uh, I already owned it, I was bored one August. I was like, I'm gonna make a podcast about feminism, this will be great. And sat down with my friend Zine, who already made a podcast, still does, it's amazing, it's called PH Divas. It's about feminism and academia and the intersection of the STEM fields and humanities. Um, so Zine and I sat down on a park bench. Now, oh, still one, there was still just one. There's still just one microphone. Park bench, one microphone, Zoom recorder. I just like to continue as I begin. And I was like, all right, feminism, let's go. What are we going to talk about? And that's how Secret Feminist Agenda began. And after I was a few months into making it, I had a phone call with Siobhan. We you know, had this grant underway. And I was like, OK, I guess it's time for me to pitch a scholarly podcast to you. Like, I guess it's time for me to come up with what my podcast is going to be. And Siobhan was like, well, isn't it Secret Feminist Agenda? And I was like, no, it's not scholarly. It's just me sitting down with scholars and talking about feminism. That's it's like I never learn. So Siobhan really pushed me to think about Secret Feminist Agenda as 
the podcasts we would use to test run our peer review. That presented a bunch of unanticipated challenges because our original approach was going to be, you know, I would make like four individual episodes and then I would submit them to the press and the press would send them out for traditional peer review and they would get revised and resubmitted and all of the, you know, two year long process it takes to do this stuff and then eventually they would get posted to the press website and there you go, they would be published. But I was already like six months into making a weekly podcast by the time we decided we were going to peer review it. So suddenly we had to stop and say, well, how are we gonna, like there's no way we can peer review a weekly podcast, that's impossible. Um, also, there's like way too many episodes, like what are we gonna do? So we had to figure out a way to really reinvent the models for how peer review was going to work with Secret Feminist Agenda. I have some clip in here, I don't remember what it is. Um, it's this. Here you go. This is the theme song. Hi, I'm Hannah McGregor, and this is Secret Feminist Agenda. I'm so excited to be bringing you the first official episode of this new podcast dedicated to the mundane, nefarious, and even insidious ways we enact feminism in our daily lives. And before I introduce you to this week's guest, I want to tell you what my secret feminist agenda is this week. Who knows what it was? Um, a little shout out before I uh, switch into the sort of nitty gritty of uh, peer reviewing podcasts, I also want to mention this third podcast project I'm involved in now. So uh, Spoken Web is a Shirk partnership grant held. The PI is Jason Camlot at the University of Con Concordia University or University of Concordia. Which one is it? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, Spoken Web is about digitizing um, the audio archives of literary events from the 60s and 70s. So these old, like, sort of reel-to-reel -reel and cassette archives that are often, I mean, archives, like, it's a box full of cassettes in somebody's trunk. And we're digitizing them. And a big part of the project is creating uh, a database that will have consistent rigorous metadata across all of the holdings at institutions across Canada so that anybody who's interested in these archives can, can discover them online and gain access to these recordings. But we're also really interested in sound-based scholarship, both what it means to do scholarship about sound and what it means to do scholarship with sound. So we started a podcast, um, which is a collaborative podcast across the entire partnership grant. So anybody affiliated with the partnership grant can make an episode. And it's our sort of experiment in doing audio-based scholarship about sound archives. So we have two episodes out so far. It's been, for me, primarily a really interesting challenge in project management, because historically I've made my podcast with a single microphone and a friend on a bench. Um, so this is, you know, a massive project with a dozen co-applicants on the grant and dozens of other people involved and archives across the country and, and lots of complexities um, that I, I have not had to grapple with before. I'm the project lead on the podcast. So um, so I'll play you just the, just the opening bit of this so you can get a feel for this one as well. Theme song composed by Jason Camelot. What stories will we hear if we listen to the archive? Welcome to the Spoken Web Podcast, stories about how literature sounds. My name is Hannah McGregor, and each month I'll be bringing you different stories of Canadian literary history and our contemporary responses to it, created by scholars, poets, students, and artists from across Canada. I'm so excited to introduce our inaugural episode, Stories of Spoken Web, an introduction to this very podcast and the project it stems from. That's all you're getting. Um, I think one thing I wanted to highlight with those is not only the sort of um, ass backwards way I found my way into podcasting, because it was never a like, I'm going to make a pod, it was just a sort of always accidentally stumbling into things, um, as well as I think the range of the way that things that 
that count as scholarly podcasting, like how they can sound. These three podcasts sound really different, are made in really different contexts with really different attitudes and spirits and kinds of relationships to the material and to the audience. They have, by definition, different levels of popularity as well as different levels of, um, let's say, uh, conventional scholarliness. And I think they give you a sense of the, the range of ways that you can tackle making something like a scholarly podcast. Um, okay, so you notice that this one's also called one. <laughs> I'm crushing it. Um, so uh, this is, I'm just going to run really quickly through um, a little bit of the background for how Siobhan and I conceive of this project, um, why it is that we're excited about podcasting as a form of scholarly communication. The first, if you were in the last session, I already talked about this. This is um, uh, Anil Dash's phrase, the web we lost. And what he's referring to is an early understanding of Web 2.0 in which it was a radically decentralized, non-corporately owned space in which people could both produce and curate their own kinds of media environments. And there was this really brief moment where that was what the internet was, right? Where you could like open up a website and customize what it looked like on your screen. And we, for the most part, have let the internet, and I say let, you know, deliberately because we mostly consented to it because people gave us free stuff and it was nice. We've let the internet become primarily a sort of corporately owned space where we voluntarily give our um, artistic and intellectual energies away to corporations in exchange for glossy interfaces. Because um, it looks a lot nicer than the bad websites we used to make. Um, but the bad websites we used to make had a lot of different kinds of radical potential as publishing spaces. And podcasts still have a lot of that radical potential. And you're going to hear news all the time about um, how podcasting is like, oh, it's going mainstream. Like every couple of years, people are like, no, no, no. OK, now it's definitely mainstream. And now it's definitely famous people. And it's going corporate. And it's, gonna, it's really going to change now. And yet, and yet, there is something about podcasting that stays really weird. No, I actually have an episode called Keep Podcasting Weird, where I'm like, we should fight for this, right? Like, we, we, we as scholars and academics and students and thinkers and librarians, like, we should fight to keep podcasting this kind of weird corner of the open web because we can tell stories in really different ways in this space um, that are getting harder and harder to carve out spaces outside or in other parts of the internet. Um, this is a piece that, that uh, came out a little while ago that was talking about um, the transformation about how podcasting is now going mainstream, right? And it uses, I think, a, quite a, a conventional, familiar narrative of the sort of um, uh, like pioneering phase, right? Like it used to be exciting. I like this. Uh, it was equally inhabitable by highly produced public radio programming, personality-driven talk radio style shows, and shaggy conversational podcasts started by anybody with a microphone. It's me. It's this guy. Um, all working the same odds of finding an audience over a decentralized ecosystem. So it's like, oh, it used to be like this, but now, and this is the sale of, Spot of Gimlet to Spotify. That's the sort of thing that triggered this particular diatribe, but like now that's over. There's this massive new player, um, podcasting, right? It's the end of podcasting's Wild West era. Um, I think we should just be instinctively suspicious of colonial narratives like this that fetishize the Wild West as a construct. Like that's creepy. Um, but also, it's, there's this attitude towards media expressed in this that says that like things just happen and we're just swept away by the waves of forces that are larger than us as though we are not ourselves sort of creators of the world that we live in. Um, so yeah, keep it weird. Um, I put this up just in case there's any bloggers in the room. I just want to make you mad. Um, but I do think that this is interesting to remember, you know, maybe like five or six years ago, the conversations we were having about blogging in the university, that was like blogging was really breaking open the way that we thought about scholarly communication and the way that we thought about informal, um, outward facing forms of scholarly communication that gathered larger audiences via regularity and accessibility. And podcasting or blogging had its moment when everybody was doing it and then um, it's, it's 
sort of over time return to like a small number of people who continue to do it very passionately and actively. And there are blogs, particularly scholarly blogs, that are still followed really closely, that are still where people are doing a lot of really significant work, particularly I think in post-secondary pedagogy, ed tech, um, those kinds of worlds, uh, the pod blogging still has an important role. Um, similarly, I think podcasting will, you know, it will hit peak podcasts at some point and then it will fall off and there will be some people who keep making them and other people who turn to, to other approaches. But I think it's worth continuing to think about what new possibilities this medium opens up. Um, so here's one of those possibilities that this medium opens up. Podcasting has this really specific intimacy to it. And this is the way people usually talk about what makes podcasting unique, but I think it's actually pretty apt. And it has to do mostly with how it is that we listen to podcasts. So we, for the most part, listen to them by plugging them into our ears and listening to them while we go about the mundane daily tasks of our lives. So we are listening to the voices of our favorite podcasters while we're in the bath, while we're doing the dishes, while we're walking the dog, while we're commuting to and from work. We are hearing the voices of strangers in our ears in spaces and situations and environments where the voices we would normally hear would be the voices of loved ones. And so we start to feel this kind of intimacy and attachment to these voices that we're used to hearing. Who, who has ever had that feeling where they like listen to a podcast and you're like, this person's my friend? Yeah. Yeah, I have whole text conversations with a friend of mine in Edmonton about how we think the McElroys are doing. Or like, Travis sounded sad on the newest episode. Do you think he's okay? These are strangers, like complete strangers. But we're just very invested in their lives. Um, so there is this, this intense feeling of intimacy. And I think that intimacy as part of what makes people willing to listen to long podcasts and listen to podcasts that are quite deep dives into niche topics. It's via the sort of intimacy of the embodied listening experience, that you're willing to come along with people on stories that, that maybe you wouldn't read necessarily. Like, if it's like a long read, you would get like bored half, if you're me, you would get bored halfway through. Maybe a hundred words in, just be like, oh, who's got the time for reading? Um, but like, I'll, I'll plug something into my ears and go for an hour long walk, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's possibility here for, for people who want to tell stories that are based in research that maybe require a different kind of attention um, or, or asking of your listeners a different kind of attention. Oh yeah, here's a quote from Glenn Weldon, um, one of the regular panelists on Pop Culture Happy Hour. Um, he says, you come to know the host's tastes, their tics, the phrases they overuse as they unthinkingly dole out tiny incremental parcels of information about their personal lives, a new baby here, a beloved pet's passing there. You realize one day that your brain has unthinkingly constructed exhaustive virtual dossiers on each of them. I love that. It's like, it's only a little creepy. It's fine. I know all of the personal details of many total strangers. That's normal and good. Um, he goes goes on to talk in this particular article about uh, how podcasting engenders what he calls a one-way intimacy. Uh, and I think it is worth challenging that, that assumption that it is one-way intimacy by definition, because I think that we can think also about the kinds of relationships we have with our listeners um, as engendering different forms of intimacy as well. But that's not this talk. Um, that's, this is this talk. <laughs> Podcasting in academia, two okay tastes that taste okay together. This once said great tastes, and then I was like, I'm not comfortable calling academia great. It is okay at best. Um, it's fine. We're all here in some relationship to it. It's fine. Um, but I do think, for all of the reasons that I've outlined so far, I do think that there is a really good fit between this medium and this content, between the kinds of work that we do in the university and the kinds of storytelling that is possible via podcasting. Um, so that leads to a question. If they fit together well, what's the barrier? Why aren't academics making podcasts instead of writing journal articles? Like, why do we still have to do all of this old conventional stuff? So this is from a, uh, a great literature review about scholarship and podcasting that my research assistant, Megan Ryland, wrote. Um, so I'm going to quote her. She writes, 
Podcasting has historically been viewed as part of the teaching work of researchers rather than the practice or distribution of scholarship. Little scholarship covers the use of podcasts by academics to communicate with their peers or distribute research, although this work is being done. The lack of attention to scholarly podcasts outside the classroom presents a strange picture in which researchers seem to value podcasts for distributing knowledge only to students. Podcasting is an accessible distribution strategy, and some among the academy have clearly learned how to use it, so why is there so little attention paid to using podcasts to supplement research? Why indeed? Here, I think, are some of the answers. Um, part of it is barriers to access, technology and expertise, right? Do we have access to the stuff we need to make podcasts? Do we know how to make a podcast? If you are already a busy and overwhelmed person, are you willing to take on learning how to work in an entirely new medium in order to find a wider, um, find a wider, wider audience for your work? Same goes for time, right? Are you willing to make the time investment needed in order to you know, find different publics for your work when, again, perhaps you are already overburdened? If you have some relationship to the university, chances are you are. Um, but all of that, at the end of the day, boils down for me to the question of credit, which is that we will be much more inspired to figure out the technology and to take the time if we know it will count in some way as part of the work we're supposed to be doing. And so the question is, well, why doesn't it count, right? I, I had another research assistant look into how many podcasts she could find on Apple Podcasts that are made by academics, but not associated with institutions. So not like a departmental or university podcast, but just like, here's a podcast about film that's made by two film scholars. Her, her initial survey, she found over 100. Lots of academics are making podcasts, and we're not putting them on our CVs, and we're not telling our department chairs about them, and we're not putting them in our job applications because they don't count. They're not serious, re real scholarship. So what's the barrier there? One of the big ones is how we count. I mean, what counts? How we decide what counts. There's a wonderful new article on um, public scholarship and the junior academic. I'm paraphrasing the title, but it's by Sarah E. Bond and Kevin Gannon. Um, and they have this to say about public-facing uh, scholarship aimed at wide consumption. They write, for too long, academe treated such work as lesser than, as not prestigious enough to count for real college faculty members. They're Americans. They mean university. Uh, considered in terms of impact and reach, however, the scholarly work, and make no mistake, it is scholarly, resonates far more widely and deeply than much of the traditional, and in large part, literally inaccessible, projects prized by a more limited view of legitimate scholarly activity. They continue, as we broaden our notions of what counts as scholarship, academics must find effective ways to assess these pivotal forms of outreach, whether it's public writing, community initiatives, or open access digital projects. So what they're saying is the problem isn't academics knowing how to make this stuff. The problem isn't academic interest in doing scholarship that sounds and looks and feels different. The problem is the constraints that we work within in academe um, that say this work doesn't count. And as long as the work doesn't count, as long as it needs to happen off the side of your desk, it's one, going to discourage more widespread uptake, but two, it's going to penalize the people working within academia who are invested in public engagement. And this will surprise few of the people in this room the people working in academia who are invested in public engagement are disproportionately women faculty, trans faculty, non-binary faculty, black, indigenous, and people of color faculty. Those are the communities who feel a sense of responsibility to publics outside of the university, so who are doing this work anyway? And are doing this work in a widespread way and are having to do this work over and above the work that they are already doing, so having to do double the work. So there's a lot at stake in terms of a sort of more widespread conversations about transforming the university. There's a lot at stake in saying, we have to make work like this count. Like it, it really actually matters to, to change how we think about what counts. So a few solutions. 
Solution one is that scholars need to get better at collaborating with those working in the university who are already engaged primarily with outward facing public work. So I'm thinking librarians, thinking curators, and thinking publishers. These are people who are already grappling with these questions, who are already doing this work, and who make absolutely ideal collaborators for these kinds of projects. We also need to revisit how we evaluate scholarship. Um, that includes peer review, as well as tenure and promotion. Um, and we need to be ready to look at what's working and what isn't working. I think it can be easy sometimes, depending on where you're positioned within the university, to act like tenure and promotion is like, a set of standards that are handed down from on high, or like peer review is a system that has existed as it is for a thousand years, as though as recently as the 60s and 70s, peer review wasn't a incredibly uneven, only sporadically practiced approach to scholarly publishing. Like, these are not only recent systems, but they are systems we designed, and they're systems that we can redesign. <laughs> like, we can just change what we think counts. Like, it, literally, we're the only people who can, because it's supposed to be peer governance. It's the idea. Um, I also, when I started this work with Wilfrid Laurier University Press, I was, um, I, I have a tendency towards being of the, let's just burn it down and salt the earth kind of attitude towards most academic structures. And um, Siobhan McMenemy, my collaborator, convinced me that perhaps there is some value in peer review. <laughs> Perhaps there are some good things happening there, and that maybe if we really sort of break down how we practice it um, and look at it from different angles, we might be able to find some good stuff worth holding on to. We don't have to sort of throw everything out at the same time. Um, so here is what we did. Uh, I've presented you this problem from two different angles, right? Structural angle and then the like. I was making a weekly podcast. What, what a terrible idea. Um, so the first decision that we made is that Secret Feminist Agenda would be a seasonal podcast um, and that we would set the limit each season is 15 interviews. So in season one, when I was doing an interview every episode, that, went, that meant season one was 15 episodes. Starting in season two, I started making interview episodes every second one. So seasons two and three are 30 episodes but it's still like 15 interview episodes per season. And that once that whole season was done, I would send all, so I'm like posting it as I go, right? It's going up every week. It's going up on like Google Play and Apple Podcasts and not on Spotify because I keep forgetting to put it there. Um, I'm only okay at podcasting. Um, but uh, so it's, you know, it's going up, it's gaining listener engagement, it's part of these public conversations. And then once the season is done, the whole Dropbox folder of MP3 files gets sent to the press, who at that point find peer reviewers for it. So um, they send out, uh, Siobhan drafted um, a unique peer review questionnaire for each season of the podcast. That is quite common, as I found out, with peer review of monographs, so the kind of peer review practiced at university presses. Um, in general, I think those of us who um, publish in journals are accustomed to the idea that double anonymous peer review is the sort of gold standard, um, that I don't know who's peer reviewing me and they don't know who I am. But at university presses, peer review is usually single anonymous because it's too hard to fully anonymize um, a book manuscript. So I won't know who my peer reviewers are, but they'll know who I am. So it wasn't that much of a step for Siobhan to say, well, we can't anonymize your podcast. That it would be wild. <laughs> Just take out all of the words I say with my voice. Um, so we're not even going to try. And actually, we're not going to anonymize the reviewers either, because we are going to ask the reviewers to speak really specifically from their spaces of expertise and their own experience. It's a feminist project, right? We're all about situated knowledges. So it's totally open peer review. So Siobhan drafted questionnaire, found a couple of peer reviewers, sent them you know, all of the episodes, but said, you know, if you're gonna only listen to some, listen to this one, this one, this one, this one. Uh, and then said, you know, listen to the ones you're gonna listen to, send back your response. Once both the responses came back, I got to read them 
I wrote a response to the peer reviews, and those three documents all went up on the press website and are completely public and open and available for anyone to read. We did the same process with the second season, so found two different peer reviewers, sent it out, got feedback, everything up on the website. And for the third season, because the peer reviewers, rather than being like, oh, well, this is weird, our peer reviewers were like, more experimental, please. And our peer reviewers were complaining about the fact that it felt weird to sit and quietly write in isolation about a conversation-based form of scholarship. And so for our third season of peer review, we got one of the reviewers from season one and one of the reviewers from season two, and we had them record a podcast episode together. <laughs> And it's just the two of them talking about the podcast. Um, and then Siobhan and I listened to it and we recorded our response together um, as a separate conversation. And then all of those audio files got sent to the press and the press was like, we don't have the expertise to edit them. And I was like, can I edit them? Is that a violation of peer review? And then we all agreed because the press has the original audio files. Um, and I promise not to take any words out just to like adjust levels and take out the fact that somebody was typing the whole time they weren't talking. Don't do that. Um, so they let me uh, sort of do just, just basic sound-based fixing. Um, and those episodes are going to go up very shortly on the press website. So. I want to end by giving you a little bit of the feel for the responses that we've gotten. What I really want to emphasize is that I went into this with a great deal of trepidation for a variety of reasons, including that, um, as many other people have, I've received extremely cruel peer review in my life, just peer review that really just felt like it wasn't remembering that I was a person with feelings. But also that Secret Feminist Agenda is a much more personal and intimate project for me than any article I've ever written has been. And so I felt more vulnerable and exposed getting feedback. Um, and this feedback was like nothing I'd ever gotten before. It's so generous and thoughtful and productive and so oriented towards embracing the spirit of the project and helping us figure out how to make it better that the experience of these rounds of peer review have totally changed my mind about peer review. I'm like, oh, peer review can be great. We just have to sort of reconstruct it a bit so that it encourages compassion, so that it's oriented towards helping us all to, to make better work. Um, so season one, uh, our first peer reviewer was Cheryl Ball. Cheryl is the editor of Kairos, which is an experimental open access digital journal. Um, Cheryl also has a personal policy. I heard this, she came back in season three. She has a personal policy that she only peer reviews for open access journals where the peer review itself is open. Um, so that's her, her personal policy. She really wants to further these kinds of open approaches to scholarly publishing. So um, what I want to point out, and this is just sort of have the information, but on the other side I pulled what I thought was the most interesting response um, of Cheryl's in season one. Like I said, this is all public. You can go read the whole thing. It's when she points out the potential weakness of podcasting as a scholarly form. She writes, we conceptually know how books end being printed. We can guess how a podcast ends, calling the end of a series. But after how many volumes? My only and most major concern with this entire project is the podcaster being able to sustain issues on a weekly basis. This is a massive amount of content, and I do not understand how she is pulling this off on the regular. I was like, whoa, this is the first time peer review has ever thought about the costs of the labor that I am putting into my work. Can you imagine a model of peer review that's like, mm, but can you make this more sustainable? What? Wild. Um, so that was a really great reminder for me, both of sort of different things you can get out of peer review, but also of a challenge with scholarly podcasting. How do we decide when it's done? There's great scholarship already done on this in the world of DH. There's a whole special issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly, I think called Done. Is that true? Anybody? I think it's called Done. That's exactly about the question of like, how do you know when a, when a digital project is done? Um, but it's an important question with a regularly released podcast as well. 
The second peer reviewer was Amanda French. Amanda French was um, delightful and entertaining for all kinds of reasons, including that she was so skeptical of the entire endeavor. And she remained skeptical through the whole peer review. She's like, podcasts have peers. They're your listeners. They're already peer reviewing you. It's the comments on Apple Podcasts. You've been peer reviewed. What are we doing here? And then we were like, is this scholarship? She was like, yeah, a scholar's doing it. Why are you asking me this? Like, she was so impatient with the entire project, but not from a like, podcasts aren't real, but from a like, oh, obviously, you're a scholar. You're saying scholarly things out loud. You're doing scholarship. Everybody calm down. It was so, just so the opposite from the kind of pushback I thought we were going to get. And so she says, um, I feel like this question, which is, um, I mean, is this, is the podcast a expression of scholarly research engagement? She says, I feel like this question is really asking, should this podcast count toward tenure? And I guess my answer is, sure, fine by me. Good luck with that. <laughs> Look, she continues, something of this nature doesn't really fit into the usual triumvirate of research, teaching, service. But I think it's that triumvirate that's at fault. In my view, people as smart and engaged as the ones on this podcast, yes, should get tenure for sneezing. Uh, <laughs> but for some reason, we live in a world where you have to prove yourself 70 times over before you might have a bare chance to earn a decent, stable living. I have always liked the term scholarly communication because that is what is going on here. Scholars communicating with each other, both those who are recorded and those who listen. I've often heard research defined as creating new knowledge, and no, I don't think this podcast does that. But what is going on in this podcast is the mutual exchange of knowledge and ideas, which is deepening the understanding of all involved podcaster and listener, podcasters and listeners. Scholars should definitely do that, whatever you call it. I wouldn't call it research, but I like it and want to encourage it. And if I could give everyone tenure, I would. <laughs> so again, I just love these peer reviews so much. They're like, sure, fine, I don't know, good luck. But she's really pointing at the fact that we know this work matters, and it's the structures in which we evaluate it that are at fault. And so if we can collectively, as communities, say, we value work that is publicly engaged, that is the exchange of ideas in a way that builds out larger audiences, let's figure out how to make it count. That's our job, right? Uh, oh, and here's my response. I just wanted to note um, my response has become increasingly absurd over time. I don't know how Siobhan lets me get away with this. So my response um, to the first round was, an opening note, I was deeply nervous about this peer review process in a way that I have not experienced since getting the reviews for my very first journal article nine years ago. Wow, hi, I am old. <laughs> so scholarship, we're doing it. Um, so uh, round two, our first reviewer was Anna Paletti. Um, Anna Paletti did, again, there's a real through line here of scholars being like, oh, you want to mess with systems? I'll show you messing with systems. So Anna Paletti was like, thank you for giving me questions. I'm going to respond to this in the form of a personal essay. <laughs> great, great, I love it. Um, but she goes on to talk about uh, the relationship between scholarship and teaching and, and what stood out for me in hers, right? So um, when we go back, Amanda French is like, no, it's not really research, but who cares? And Anna is like, actually, I think this is teaching. She says, um, several times whilst listening to the podcast, I wondered whether what McGregor was doing in Secret Feminist Agenda was more akin to teaching than to research. Given the scholarship slash teaching definition of the profession is underpinned by a binary logic of gender, masculinity is associated with research, femininity with teaching, I began to think that a possible scholarly contribution to feminism made by Secret Feminist Agenda is not to bring scholarship out from the confines of the university by publishing it differently, but to bring teaching as a praxis, an ethics, a political action dedicated to education as a form of freedom out of the university. That just gave me goosebumps. I was like, ooh, education as a form of freedom. That's so exciting. Um, yeah, so Anna's like, nah, it's teaching, but we should count teaching more highly. Great. 
cool, absolutely on board. And then final, our second peer reviewer for season two is Carla Rice, who's Canada Research Chair in Care, Gender, and Relationships at uh, the University of Guelph. Carla is the other person. Um, Carla and Cheryl are the two people who came back for season three for the um, uh, podcast style recorded conversation. Um, and what did I, I pulled this out because she has a really great way of thinking about sort of meaning making and uh, digital technologies. So she says, our story making methodology brings together, no, that's not it. Mm -mm -mm. Um, yeah, there we go. While in our work we approach stories as meaning-making devices, as primary ways that people make sense of, interpret the flow of their raw experiences, we also understand stories as evidence, as accounts of experience that need to be attended to for how they surface or center elements of people's psychic and social worlds that have been disregarded. After listening to Secret Feminist Agenda, a series that at its core features and unpacks stories told by McGregor and her guests, I'm wondering whether the feminist podcast may operate in similar ways to that of our video-based story work, both as a medium for the translation and dissemination of feminist ideas and as evidence for the legitimacy and trustworthiness of those ideas. And that's what really struck me, right? That she's saying that podcasting can not only be a sort of vehicle for sharing research, but be can become itself evidence for the realness of different kinds of knowledge. And that's where the really transformative edge of podcasting as scholarly communication is for me. Not that I can basically remediate a journal article in the form of an engaging conversation, but that I can actually say something different, something that there isn't space for in an article or a monograph. And that the podcast can not only build space for that kind of work, but can actually articulate the fact that there are different ways of knowing, which is a fundamentally feminist intervention. So, um, yeah, and here's my responses. Confession time, I cried while reading these peer reviews. Just increasingly off the hook. Um, yeah, the final thing I want to point at is that um, much like this is just a random selection of some uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts because um, I'm happy to talk about this more uh, later, but uh, at the heart of this project for me is the fact that it is public, like publicly engaged community accountable scholarship. And so my relationships with my, my listeners and the feedback I get from my listeners um, and the opportunities to have conversations with my listeners are at the heart of the work. Um, and so I very much keep in mind Amanda's point about, um, you know, where is the real peer review happening and who am I ultimately accountable to? That's the last slide on the ball. Here's some findings. Who knows what this slide says? Podcasting is cool, increases engagement, partner with librarians, uh, don't divide our labor into the hierarchy of research, teaching, and service. Uh, yeah, I already said all this stuff. Cool. There you go. Thank you so much, Hannah. We only have time for one question. So no, two questions. Two questions. Um, if you raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, I have a question about citational practices, because yeah. that's the first time I've seen someone in a conference format or workshop acknowledge the writing of their research assistant, which is something we're really oh. bad at doing in literary studies, right? We get RAs to do the photocopying and then we thank them in tiny print the acknowledgements. So or I'm maybe hoping, not even that. Or not even there. So I'm hoping you can say a little more about podcasting and citational practices. And this might be better for another day, but um, public facing scholarship faces risks that insular scholarship behind paywalls doesn't. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Haha, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, citational practices have been really important to figuring out how to sort of marry podcasting and scholarship. Uh, that includes, you know, every episode is accompanied by show notes. Uh, those show notes are a work cited uh, that tries to attribute everything significant that I say in the podcast. And I try really hard to make sure that, you know, every source that I'm using is being properly cited via the show notes. Um, 
The other thing is that the fact that I do most of my scholarship these days as a conversation has really helped me to get better at recognizing the dialogic and collaborative nature of all of the work that I do. So the more that I spend my time learning things by having conversations with people on mic, the less natural it feels like to be like, well, my, yeah, sure, I had 100 conversations with my research assistant about this, but I'm going to pretend that their contribution to this work wasn't real. Because it, it feels exactly the same in terms of the texture of those interactions. It feels the same as the conversations I have on mic. So the more I do collaborative work, the more natural it feels like to think about all of these different dimensions of my work as collaborative. Um, the other part of the question, I, I do think that, that I mean, you, you and I can talk about it more, but, but here's what I will say. I have been um, a fundamentally public-facing scholar since I began my job at SFU three years ago. Um, in that time, I have had a very powerful, award-winning, beloved Canadian authors write to my department chair demanding that my podcast be shut down. I've had so many people tweeting about ne me needing to be fired that university communications had to intervene. I've had, you know, hate emails. I've had Twitter swarms. Like, being a public facing scholar has costs. And uh, at the university, we really love to push people to do public scholarship, and then we love to provide them with exactly zero forms of support. SFU has a new program trying to encourage women to be more engaged as public intellectuals. That's like, here's how you do an interview. Here's how you explain your research on the radio. And I was like, what a neat program. Is there, a, as part of it, do you tell them what to do when they get doxxed? And the organizers were like, no, what's that mean? I was like, cool. <laughs> you, need to, you need to keep your faculty safe. Um, and that risk obviously increases exponentially with um, the kinds of uh, sort of subject positions of the speaker, right? So the kinds of risks that I encounter as a cis white woman doing public scholarship are like nowhere near the uh, kinds of risks and vulnerabilities of my trans colleagues, of my indigenous colleagues, of my black colleagues. Um, and, and universities need to get a lot better at figuring out how to support faculty and students. My God, students Students are getting sued right now, and universities are like, do we have to pay for your lawyer? That's a conversation for another day when I have beer. <laughs> Second question. Oh, are you all? Oh, yeah, great. I was like, don't listen to Matt. Thank you very much for that talk. I'm a librarian here, and I work around open scholarship a lot. Um, so some of the things that you mentioned about peer review, there's always a pushback, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yours is peer review after the fact. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of RPT committees want peer review before. Yeah, and want it to be so anonymous. So how do you how do you talk to RPT committees? How do you talk to your senior faculty members who are on that RPT committee to move the spectrum? Yeah, so that's where um, the collaboration with Siobhan comes in really handy. Siobhan is a senior, well-established scholarly editor who worked most of her career at University of Toronto Press and is now managing editor at Wilfrid Laurier University Press. She has a ton of connections in the university press world and in the world of like sort of higher level, you know, deans and chairs and like a lot of people who she has edited their books. They know her and they respect her expertise as somebody whose job it is to acquire and vet and circulate scholarship. So, I mean, if I showed up in a dean's office and was like, hi, I think my podcast should count, they would be like, cute, leave. Um, but Siobhan has the position from which to um, articulate those arguments, you know, because of her, her institutional context and because of her experience, she's in a position to articulate those arguments in a way that I am not, which again leads me back to those like, you know, collaborating with people who come from different parts of this work. Um, so that's Siobhan's side of the research, essentially. And what she's doing right now is 
um, building connections with other university presses that are also engaged in open forms of scholarship, um, going to you know the Association of University Presses conference so they can start collaboratively developing um, essentially sort of statements that can then be shared at universities to say, like, as far as we're concerned, this is real scholarship, right? And that's the kind of like starts to push the sea change of institutions starting to recognize it. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming to this session. Uh, this ends the second part of our three-part day today. And please join me in thanking Hannah for this great talk. Thanks.